Okay. All right. Well, I'll I'll give my little uh, spiel to start with, and then um, uh, we can carry on. I, I like I said, I'm not really expecting um, people to turn up today. So I just want to welcome everybody um, to uh, this professional development workshop. This is the 11th in our series and, and the final one for this year. And I have no idea what's going to happen in the future, whether they're going to do them <laughs> again or not. But um, anyway, it's been a, it's been a grand season. Um, all these um, workshops were made possible by Canadian Heritage and um, our incubator program for on cue has three development opportunities there are these professional development workshops there are mentorships and um, internships that have been going on um, these are intended to serve a range of performing artists working in different disciplines at different stages in their career and both within the city of regina and provincially and as part of the incubator program this is the 11th in the series on cue performance hub is a nonprofit performing arts organization with a new organizational model and approach to offering um, a collaborative producing model serving local artists and diverse audiences in Regina and beyond. Um, our aim is to enliven uh, Regina's downtown core and activate connections between performing artists, businesses, and audiences. We bring together artists across dance, music, theater and spoken word. Our goal is to better, re, uh, to better retain, is better retention of creatives within our community through a supportive environment and that facilitates innovation and the realization of creative ideas while providing practical professional development of the business and administrative skills creative entrepreneurs need to survive in, uh, as independent artists. On Q Regina, is grateful to be working on Treaty 4 land. This is the territory of the Nehawak, the Anishinaabek, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. We also acknowledge the people of Treaties 2, 6, 8, and 10, which we also serve. We recognize the past and ongoing harms experienced by people and embrace a mandate to work with them in fostering greater understanding and a better way forward. So along with us today are our interpreters, Sue Schmidt, Sue Schmidt and Rachel Jansen, and also with us today are Michelle de Cotonier and Holliston Logan to talk about what accessibility means for the performing arts. Michelle is a multiple award-winning producer, playwright, director, co-creator, administrator, advocate and activist with 35 years experience in the arts and voluntary sectors on local, national and international scope. She spent the first 15 years of her artistic career working in artistic, technical and administrative roles with established theater and film companies throughout Alberta. She spent the last 20 years exclusively prioritizing equity and diversity in the arts through her own company, Stage Left Productions, a hub of aesthetic innovation, cultural autonomy, and intercultural equity for diverse artists. A leading contributor to Canada's deaf, disability, and mad arts domain, and a global center for the theater of the oppressed. Holliston Logan, um, also known as Holly, um, is a Michif Isque and a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. She is a daughter, sister, auntie, and dog mom to an energetic corgi cross named Beatrice. She has worked extensively in Indigenous programming at the University of Calgary in a variety of areas. Currently, Holly is the Indigenous Health Program Manager at the Indigenous, Local, and Global Health Office at the University of Calgary's Cummings School of Medicine. In her role at the IHP, Holly supports Indigenous students, staff, and faculty within the CSM. She also supports Indigenous health-focused educational initiatives, research projects, service innovations, and meaningful institutional action towards reconciliation and decolonization. 
External to her work with the university, Holly works as a project manager for the Matriarch Movement, an online platform, podcast, and nonprofit focused on uh, a nonprofit focused on amplifying Indigenous women's voices and providing wellness workshops intertwined with mediation, movement, and medicine. And as the digital impact coordinator for Stage Left Productions, a grassroots popular theater company. Um, of diverse artists and non-artists, catalysts of change, who create pathways to systemic equity in and through the arts. She spends time supporting community organizations, making meaningful change, always seeking to be a helper in whatever capacity she can. So now just a few house guidelines. If there were any questions, should anybody join us later on, they can either put up their hand or, or <laughs> signal me in the chat or something like that, and we'll try to allow for time. Um, but for now, please mute yourself, and I'll turn it over to Michelle and Holly. Thank you, Brad. Um, just as an aside, you have a great narration voice. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it was nice to listen to that. Okay, I'm... Uh, I am actually going to work off of screen sharing because I have a multiple learning disabilities and will not be able to provide this presentation otherwise. So I, if it's okay, everybody's okay, I'm gonna start sharing screen now. Okay, here it comes. Great, how is the view on that? Looks good to me. Okay, I'll just make sure I know how to use it. So, we're going to provide a presentation, Holly and I, as agents of Stage Left Productions and many other things that Brad just summarized for us. Thank you. Um, we're going to try to expand the access discourse a little bit. So normally when you talk about accessibility in the arts, we start with a conversation about audience and then it gets expanded into artists. But we're also going to try to expand the spectrum a little bit and take it into a conversation about aesthetics and how we approach accessibility from an aesthetic perspective. We're going to start a little bit. Oops, sorry, I'm just going to run through the slides. I'm going to try to run through the slides. There we go. So I'm just going to do a presentation overview. So we're going to run through the entire presentation and the time for question and answers. And then there's also going to be resources provided. Brad, of course, and on cue Regina, they're of course going to archive this and I will provide a list of accessibility resources and links available to them. Most of the access information we're going to present on today is freely available on the internet. So we'll provide those links and when it gets posted, this presentation slide deck will be available along with all of the resources and links. So we just did the introductions, but I will revisit that and talk a little bit also and introduce you to the presentation language we're going to use. Part three of this presentation is going to be access to disability equity. So we're going to start with a framework around intersectionalism and how to look at the differences between Western models of disability and non-Western models of disability so that we can continue to diversify the disability arts domain as much as possible and making excuse me, making a welcome environment for our diverse peers. Part four, then we're going to look at access for audiences and artists, and this will be the stuff you probably showed up for more than anything. So it's uh, access for the culturally diverse, looking at the specifics of access for people who are neurodiverse and others. And I want to stress that even though I've separated it out into separate sort of disabilities or areas of disability, none of these access tools are mutually exclusive. They work for all different people. And the more you have, the more tools you have in your toolbox, the more accessibility and accommodation you can provide for anybody. So we'll go through visual impairments and I will try to change the slide again. Oh, I'll click on the slide. Oops, sorry. <laughs> there you go. So we'll continue access for audiences. Then we'll look at access for professional artists artists, so the legal duty to accommodate, the limits to that, undue hardship, the Canadian Actors' Equity Association agreements, informed consent protocols, and then we're going to summarize access versus accommodation. From there, we'll look at access for art, disability art, so disability inclusive versus disidentified, and so on. And then again, we'll provide the links. Okay, click. Oh, come on. Sorry, I don't know how to reuse the tools. Did anybody know how to do this? There we go. There we go. End of part one. Thank you. Sorry, I just updated stage left software. And so I'm just learning how to use Acrobat Pro. All right, I'm not going to go through the introductions again in detail because Brad did a very 
a generous introduction and an embarrassing one. Thank you very much. But I am, uh, I will brag a little bit and just say that I am proud to say I'm one of the most experienced disabled artists in the Western world. So I've done a lot of work in national networking and international networking. And this is just specific to disability arts. It doesn't include, which does and doesn't include a lot of the work we do as a center for the theater of the oppressed. So besides national networking. We've also done an extensive amount of work in presenting. And when I say we, it's me and my stage left team, which has been over 10,000 different disabled diverse artists in the last 20 years. And it is stage left 20th anniversary actually this year. So we've also done a ton of production and training work for artists. Like we've done a bunch of service work and that's really what we are right now. We're a disability art service support organization. So we're available to provide knowledge sharing, um, and resources for the sector, resources for artists. We give paid work to a ton of people wherever we can. We do presentations like this and so on and so forth. But really what underpins everything that we do is social justice, the using the arts to affect personal and social transformation. And that's why how we use our theater of the oppressed practice. Holly, did you wanna introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, I spelled your name wrongly. I yeah. just, sorry about that, it's my learning disabilities. That is A-OK, -okay. no worries at all. Um, nothing in particular to add. Thank you for the thorough and thoughtful introduction, Brad. Um, I would just say I'm really pleased to be here today, although I might not work as directly within the art sector. There's a lot of intersection with the work that I do in Indigenous health and the arts, and I'm grateful to be here with Michelle today to share a little bit about um, non-Western models and some decolonial models and how those might be of use in approaching your arts practices. Thank you, Holly. Um, and it's also, I just want to mention, it's very important for me that you're here, Holly, um, because I, although I say I've done 40 years worth of decolonization work, and during that time I've received a lot of teachings and been a lot of knowledge exchange, um, I don't want to misrepresent any of those teachings. So um, thank you, Holly, for being on the call. If I say anything that's culturally inappropriate, please correct me as necessary, whenever necessary, and jump on in. Okay, thank you for that. Like, well, two pages of introductions, and I still spelled your name wrongly. Sorry, Holly. I will correct that before I send the slide deck, Brad. <laughs> thank okay. you. Okay, so one of the things I just want to mention is a presentation language. Um, the core terms I'm going to be using is disability or slash dis. And I'm, that is, of course, exclusive of DEF, MAD, A, B, C, and D, and all of the other acronyms, but it's just for ease of communication. So I will just use the dis, disability, meaning all people with all kinds of impairments, and I will do that with apologies to everybody. Um, so, and also disability arts and dis arts is for the entirety of the deaf disability and mad arts domain. And that because the full acronym is DDMAAC, deaf, small d deaf, big d deaf, hard of hearing, disabled, and so on. And if I had to say that out loud every time, we'd be here for four hours in the presentation and I'd be so dyslexic, I couldn't actually do the presentation. So we're just using this for a short form for ease of communication. And we acknowledge that I have erased a whole bunch of cultural different distinctions between us all in the process. So I offer that up with apologies. Uh, and one of the core concepts we want to stress and what we're looking at is the distinction between disability as a fixed innate individual condition and this idea of disablement, which is a, an imposed set of social conditions that happen to uh, racialize and, and oppress peoples within disability communities. And so people can experience poverty, for example, as a form of disablement. So people who live in communities that are under-resourced and are, ex are close to environmental toxins have an increased um, prevalence of impairment as a result of those social conditions, not because of how they were born or an accident or anything like that. So we make a distinction in DMAC, and I should mention that um, Stage Left runs uh, the Deaf Disability Mad Arts Alliance of Canada, and, the, and it's a very diverse national network of disabled artists and disablement is, an, is a, a way in to the disability community for people who are more diverse and don't necessarily align with the politics of disability identity. Um, so the major differences between disability and disablement Disability in a Western framework, we tend to think of that as an individual condition. I have cerebral palsy, I have mental illness, I am hearing impaired. Um, in the terms of non-Western, more on the disablement side of this spectrum, it's not an either or, it's a spectrum. 
um, we think of disability as a collective condition. So indigenous peoples experience colonization. Colonization has resulted in over prevalence of mental illness in indigenous communities, for example, only. And, that, and also in, in, in immigrant communities and in racialized communities and in disability communities as a collective rather than as individuals. So in disability, we think of it as an innate or an acquired impairment usually. So we do think about it as, oh, I have Down syndrome or I'm a deaf person. In disab disablement, we think of it as more as an imposed impairment. I, have, I am experiencing poverty. I am experiencing environmental poisoning. So it's something that has happened to you rather than something that you've acquired or were born with. So disability in a, in a Western model aligns with this idea of rugged individualism, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, be the best person you can be. It disablement, and we, we talk about it more as a community wellness. So it's not you being well on your own, it's you being a collective and healthy part of your community. In disability, we look at medical intervention as a solution. Oh, I'm feeling sick today, so what medicines can I take or what medical treatments or what mindfulnesses things can I do to feel better? In disablement, we also focus on social equality. That will, if we alleviate the conditions of poverty, we can alleviate the impacts of impairment on multiple communities. So in disability, again, Western worldviews tend to be dominant on that side of the spectrum. On the disablement side of the spectrum, it's non-Western worldviews. Nobody's on the call, so I will not pause for questions. Anything you wanna to add to that, Holly? No, I think we're, we're good. We'll dive into some more of the concepts related to disablement shortly. Great, okay. We'll jump forward now into models of disability. So um, we probably, those of you who are familiar with the disability arts domain, you've probably heard a lot of this before, but I'm gonna put it into a context for you. There are these, what are called Western models of disability, and they were developed purely administratively. During the era of DE institutionalization, we know, you know pre-1950s that people with disabilities were sh shuttered away into institutions. When we de-institutionalized people and developed models of community inclusion, these were the models of support that we offered to people to live in the community. These models of support have turned into worldviews, how you see disability, how you perceive being a disabled person, or how you perceive, uh, if you're non-disabled, is how social attitudes toward the disabled. So here's a really quick summary. So I call this the political worldview, and I don't mean politics as, oh, I'm voting, we're in an election here in Alberta right now, so I'm gonna be specific. I'm, it's not, I don't, I'm not talking about I'm voting conservative or I'm voting liberal or NDP. I'm talking about a theater construct. As you, if you're a playwright, if you're an artist, you have a political worldview. You have a, you've been shaped by your own personal lived experience and what you write about that filters into what you write about or what you perform. So it's your worldview and it shapes your artistic practice. So first of all, we have this thing called the charitable model. And this quote comes from the Jerry Lewis telethons. You have to be at least my age to remember them though, I think. But uh, Jerry Lewis was, he's famous. This is literally a quote. He raised money for us poor, pitiable half humans. So it's this attitude that people with disabilities are lesser than in, in society. And we need the non-disabled people to raise money to help lift us up out of our poor conditions. With all due respect, <laughs> we, resent, we resent and we reject this model in disability arts. <laughs> although it still exists in the disability arts domain. So then we have this thing called the medical model, and that's where we see the, what we call inspirational super crips. So yay, let's celebrate with all due respect, Rick Hansen, yay, look at him, oh, mind in motion, overcoming his disability. We didn't celebrate Rick when he became disabled. We only celebrated Rick Hansen when he was celebrated for overcoming his disability. Look at all the things he can achieve. So that's the medical model and it's all about fixing the person. Okay, if you break your leg, we will repair it for you. If you break your back, we will help you walk again. We will make you whole again. So it's a little bit in our minds from disability culture perspective, it's a negative perception of disability again. What's wrong with me? I'm not broke. Don't try to fix me. Let me be who I am. Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently my mouse is overly sensitive. Okay, then we have this thing called the administrative model. And we summarize it as you must be this disabled to ride. So it's how you get categorized. If you have cerebral palsy, you go to this agency and you get these services. If you're blind, you go to the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. If you're mentally ill, you go to the Canadian 
what's it called? Canadian Mental Health Association. So it's basically where your services are available to you, but you have to qualify. You have to be a get a, an, what's called an accredited disability. And we don't accredit poverty as a disability. So people who are experiencing forms of disablement get segregated out of administrative and social services. So then we have this thing called the social model and that's the foundation of the disability arts, the global disability arts movement. It's I'm not disabled by my wheelchair, it's the lack of ramps in social settings. So I, I am fine, I can go to work, but I can't get into my office because there's stairs. So that's the social model, get rid of those stairs, give me a ramp, I'm a functional member of society, period, the way I am. It's not me, it's society's lack of willingness to accommodate me. And then we have this new thing that's emerged since the disability arts movement, or in my opinion, as a result of the disability arts movement, we have this thing called the affirmational model of disability. And the slogan for it is why try to fit in when you were born to stand out. So put your unique self on stage, celebrate that, make your impairment an aesthetic property in your performance. Show people that you use wheelchairs and you use walkers and you need straws to drink and all those things. Just be who you are and let's celebrate disability as diversity rather than a limited condition. Okay, and so, it also forms how we describe our social identities, your worldview. So if you're a charitable model person, you might say, I'm a person with a disability. Or if you're really proud and you're in the social model, you might say, oh, I'm a proudly disabled person. And it's a spectrum. Some days I'm a person with a disability because I'm not feeling proud of that. Other days I'm like, yeah, disability, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the deaf community, we go from hard of hearing to small d deaf. Small d deaf means I'm not quite an ASL signer yet. I'm just coming into the community, but I use oral forms of communication, but I still belong to the deaf slash hard of hearing community. Big D deaf means I'm full on disability culture, deaf culture, I mean, pardon me. So I use ASL as a communication language. I don't, I use visually based communications. In the sick, it's you're chronically ill or you go to a sick person or we have this new word called spoonie. I'm sorry, I forgot where it came from. Do you remember Holly? Yeah, um, I can't remember the individual or the group, but um, I do know that the, the spoony context that comes from, you know, the idea that you have a certain number of spoons that you wake up with every day and there's certain energy exchanges that require these spoons. So you're, um, you're, you're, I guess, like almost rationing your spoons throughout the day and making sure that if I wake up with eight spoons today, versus 12 yesterday, now how am I going to prioritize my use of those spoons today to manage my energy? Great, thank you. So yeah, that's a perfect summary of living with chronic illness. And then of course you see, and these are all Western models of identity development. So when you add indigenous, black, queer, cis, poor, sick, disabled, then you start to see descriptions of all of your identity and everything that matters to you. Or then on the converse other side of that spectrum, sometimes you get people that just say, I'm a person, period. My disability has nothing to do with how I see the world. Okay, so here's a more creative way of understanding all of this. So this is from a colleague of mine, her name's Ju Gosling and she's in the UK and she created this art exhibition. And so the charitable model basically means I want to lift up the disabled. So I organize social events for affluent non-disabled people. And this is with all due respect, we're just being playful because humor really helps a lot. Um, they raise money that creates jobs for the non-disabled people who organize these events. Additional funds provide the disabled people we think are deserving with the things we think they need. So an example of that is the Jerry Lewis telethons for us poor pitiable half humans. And although we're not using that language anymore, we do still see the same sort of fundraising events where we're raising money, not just for the disabled, but for the poor and for the, the disadvantaged and all those sort of things. So that's the charitable model in a nutshell. Then we move on to the medical model. And here's our doctor who says, I want to cure the disabled. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like if you want to be more functional, go for it. So I invented and administer tests to classify disabled people according to what I think are their impairments. Then I carry out experiments to try to make them more like me, which is normal, healthy, functional. If I fail, oh, sorry, she's very political. If I fail, I try to identify and kill them before they are born. Um, so then this is true. Now, how many of you who are mothers 
um, were offered a test to find out if your baby had Downs or not when you were in, in when the baby was still being developed. This still happens today, but it's in a less drastic context. We still offer women today the opportunity to abort their babies if we know in advance they are going to be disabled. So even though it's not as harsh of an attitude, we are still practicing this today. Um, in here in Alberta, we had a eugenics board until 1972, and we had a sexual sterilization act until 1972, and the institution for people with disabilities in which all of these sterilizations happened is still in operation. So the medical model is still very, very common, and not just from the 1940s and 50s. Okay. And then we'll move to the administrative model where I want to support the disabled people. And so again, this is just a, what kind of a disability do you have? Where do you go to get the services you want? I'm just going to go quickly because I'm cognizant of the time. And also the slide deck will be available to everybody. Okay, clicking. So this is the social model. I want to liberate the disabled. And this is where we start to go from individual models to collective models. Let's all come together as a community and let's fight for our rights. Let's lie down in front of buses and until they make them accessible for our wheelchairs. Let's crawl upstairs and drag our wheelchairs behind us until they build wheelchair ramps. This is what we did in the 1950s. I mean, if you want to get a really, really great history of the disability rights um, community and activism in North America, watch the movie called uh, Crip Camp. I think it's available on Netflix, but it's an awesome history of disability activism. Okay, so that's the social model. And then I'll move to the affirmation model. And there's no pictures of it from Jude because it didn't exist when she developed that. And that was only maybe nine or 10 years ago. So the affirmation model just is a spectrum is from feeling as being shamed in society as not good enough to being a sassy member of society. So yeah, I'm totally fine the way I am. I don't need to be made better. There's nothing wrong with me. You don't need to fix me. Disability is a form of diversity. So this model came out of a critique of the social model because the social model was just overemphasized of structure. Yeah, it, uh, sorry, it ignored the personal and experiential aspects of disability, but it's a celebration of disability. Sorry, my cat's just trying to get cuddles and he's distracting me. Sorry, little guy. Um, so it's uh, we celebrate the values of disability pride and the countercultural worldviews of the disability arts movement. And I, I'm proud to say that the work that Stage Left has done over the last 20 years in Canada has been a huge contributor to the development of the affirmation model. And it's a non-tragic view of disability and of impairment. Okay, so those are Western models of disability. And then we move into non-Western models. Do you want to go, Holly? Do you want me to summarize and you just jump in? You, um, you can summarize and jump in, but I do want to provide just a reflection point for everyone as, as we make this transition. Um, I noticed one of the things I was reflecting on as Michelle was speaking through the Western models was the power dynamics available within that modern, within those various models and how you can see that power slowly shift as the models are critiqued and developed and over time and we move from one to the other. And there's going to be an even larger shift in power as we move into these collective models. So just remaining conscientious of where the power is held in those various approaches. That's so awesome. Thank you, Holly. So that takes us then to non-Western models of disability. So again, the fundamental difference between individual and collective rights. So and it starts with an understanding of rights-based health. So it's not about me as an individual, me needing to get better. It's the world needs to get better. The way we treat human beings needs to improve. So this is the United Nations human rights framework. So I'm going to try to stop touching my mouth so much. So it's claiming and exercising rights on the patient side. It's uh, you have patients belief that patients have the capacity to be empowered. So people who are disabled are not broken. People who are sick are not incapable. They have the ability to become empowered. On the doctor side, the doctors have this obligation to fulfill their obligations to meet the patient where they're at. If I don't want to be cured, fixed, improved, make my life fine the way it is. Don't try to insist I have surgery. And so here is the, the patient, the patient, what's it? Uh, the doctor needs to develop capacities for social accountability, not just for the doctor's, what's it called, Holly, the oath the, to do no harm. So sometimes you- The Hippocratic oath. The Hippocratic oath, yeah. So you have to develop social accountability within that. So if the Hippocratic oath is very individualized. I'm a doctor, I can cure you. I'm a doctor, I can cure you. you that, how can you cure poverty? 
Where's your accountability in that? So it's about fulfilling your social obligations, not just your human rights or your health obligations. So it happens through assessment of the person, not just, I mean, not just assessment of the patient, but a causal analysis. So what's causing this person's depression? Poverty, not, not a health condition, but a social condition. So what's my role of the doctor in fixing that problem? Is it just to prescribe antidepressants or is it to, Try to help that person connect to better resources or what else and so on and so forth. How do we attend to the social impacts and the social impositions? So this becomes a, a collective capacity analysis. What can we do as a team? What are our collective assets? And how do we, as Holly mentioned, how do we equalize the power dynamic of wellness? Holly, anything you want to add? No, I think that was great. Okay, thank you. All right. And then we get into this, and this is, comes from the civil rights movement and from anti-racism communities primarily, collective versus individual wellness models. So one example among many more, but this applies to almost every racialized community we've had opportunity to work with in stage left, and it's been an extensive amount of diversity, but this tends to be consistent, and it's this concept of collective healing. And again, the fundamental difference is it's not just about the individual's condition of a heart attack or whatever it is, or thyroid disease. It's about how does 500 years of inherited traumas from slavery, from indentured servitude, from immigration processes, from the Chinese head tax in Canada, for example, from contact and colonization. So the only way in which Black people, for example, in Canada can heal is if we also attend to the harms of racism. You cannot be well as an individual if we're not attending to the social consequences. So that's basically collective wellness in a summary of it. Yeah, and one of the things that really stands out to me about collective wellness as a concept is the embedding of relationships within it, right? So a lot of the, the harms that have been <clears throat> done through societal means our means of disconnecting different relationships we have, whether that's with ourselves, whether that's with peers, whether that's with nature. And a collective healing model is a restoration of not just resources, but also of those relationships um, and a, a recentering of those relationships in, I guess, like that, that safe space or what we often refer to as ethical space, a concept that was um, defined by Willie Ermine. So that space that exists between different people, different lived experiences, different worldviews, and um, coming together within that space and finding that healing there in that relational aspect. Right, thank you. Thank, that's what I mean by collectivism, it's relational. Um, in EDIA in, in the Western model and in the arts sector right now, it's still within this individualized model. So it's EDIA, and it's something you can learn. You can take a course and you can post on your website. This collectivism, you can't do that. It's not representational models of diversity. These are relational models of diversity, and you can't affect any kind of change unless you engage in experiential relationships and knowledge exchange processes with the communities you're endeavoring to be inclusive of. Awesome. Thank you, Holly. Okay, next slide. So here's another example. This comes more from psychology. It's called radical healing. So originally it was called radical psychology and it was in the 60s during the countercultural hippies revolution and the sexual revolution and the feminist revolution where it was about women come this come together around our kitchen table and, and find our collective power. Radical healing was the same thing. Um, it's a psychiatric model where it's talking about, it's not just how do you go off in a room and heal your traumas, it's how do you deal with the whole of what's coming at you from society. So it's not just an in, in from the inside out model, it's an outside in model again. So it's attending to social justice and liberation because that's, and that's the difference between healing trauma if you are a traumatized individual, you can heal that through individualized therapy, psychology. Those individualized traumas can be healed from within. External traumas that have been imposed on you, those can't be healed from within. Those have to be healed collectively from within society. So it's looking at interlocking systems of oppression and hate and social justice and bringing that together with the individual model of achieving psychological wellness. Holly, anything? Yeah, one of the things I always think about with radical healing and, you know, that how it how it brings together the internal individualistic and the external um, is that, you know, that 
we, when we're moving into collective models, it's not that we're negating that individual healing or the power of it. Um, that is still a fundamental component of the of radical healing of any sort of collective approach to wellness. And it builds that individual capacity to then be able to not only cope with those external oppressions and hatreds and systemic pressures, but also to then also be able to support the addressing of them and the changing of them. So there's still a need for this individual healing and wellness within it, but it then takes that pressure away from that individual because there's also that collective side to it. So it's a little bit about that balance coming back in, right? Awesome, thanks for reminding me of that, Holly. Um, we work a lot in Stage Left with oppressed community groups and they always feel that they are failures that they are individual failures in society rather than individuals who cannot overcome the burdens that are put on them by an unequal society or an inequitable society. Thank you, Holly. Okay, I'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so now we're looking at moving into holistic health models and we're moving into an example of an indigenous framework. Um, I, we don't have one from our, the coming school of medicine, Ollie. <laughs> I, I wanted to use one from, we need to develop one from the indigenous local global health office because it's, it's so expansive anyway. So I took this one from the First Nations Health Authority in BC because I had permission to do so. This is a community that I've worked with. And so it's, a, so it's just one example from a Canadian, quote unquote, uh, from a First Nation Métis Inuit example, meaning in Canada. Um, and Holly, do you want to just talk about this? Because it's not my culture. Sure, yeah. So one of the things that I find within this um, Indigenous framework, as an example, there's, you know, different ways to represent Indigenous frameworks, and obviously um, different Indigenous communities are going to approach things more specifically or differently than others, but there, there do tend to be um, underlying common values and ethics and principles that span a variety of Indigenous frameworks, um, and one of that really being the the I guess the encompassing nature of everything being connected. So you'll notice that within this model, even graphically, there's not so much delineation or differentiation between, you know, something being over here versus something being over here. And these things are addressed separately. Um, everything is interwoven and interrelated. And so in order to address one aspect of these, it's going to ripple out and impact the others. So if we're focusing on our individual wellness, we also need to be conscientious of that, I guess, that relationship and how it's going to ebb and flow outward in our interactions with others and with society and place us there. Sorry, my dog just walked into the room. I thought that door was shut. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's that it's that um, that lack of distinction, that lack of siloing, and that recognizing that everything is going to be interconnected, and that there is that collective responsibility that extends beyond just that human interaction as well. And that wellness is not just, you know, rooted in how we interact with our peers, but it's also rooted in how we interact with systems and the environment and all of those relationships together. Um, Michelle, do you want to add to that? No, the only thing I want to add is I'm going to jump to the next slide and um, to just reinforce the point that every nation, I've worked with about 90 different nations and each nation has its own protocols, its own framework, its own understanding. So the next slide is just an example of that. So here's another indigenous framework. Again, just one that I have permission to use because I've worked with this particular agency in this community. So here's one for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander example. And I chose that because Canada and Australia, we have a very similar history of colonization. So it's um, so I, from across the country, I mean, across the world, we have two very different um, indigenous communities with similar experiences of colonization and similar but profoundly different frameworks. Um, do, do you feel comfortable to comment on this one, Holly? Just highlight differences and similarities? Yeah, I think that, so one of the, one of the things I was also thinking about is, you know, when we talk about indigenous frameworks, um, I think there's a lot of hesitancy for folks to want to dig into them or utilize them or learn more about them for fear of, you know, doing something wrong or appropriating or, you know, not understanding the full context. But I think that Indigenous health frameworks and Indigenous ways of knowing, um, if we think about them as parallel pathways, you have the Indigenous worldview here and you would have a Western worldview here. 
And this space in between is what I referred to earlier as that ethical space. And that's where opportunities for innovation and collaboration and meaningful engagement between different worldviews exists. And so if you, by moving into that space, you're beginning to ask those questions, you're beginning to learn about the opposed or the, the differing worldview, and you're beginning to um, find ways to innovate and bring the concepts that you already have in your own worldview um, and align them with opposing worldviews and find ways to bring them together. And that is that ethical space is where a lot of that healing happens. It's in that critical discourse of, you know, identifying the different societal disablements in your life, the different pressures, and then finding ways to deconstruct that and move it into a more holistic framework of healing. That's where the healing happens is in that ethical space as you begin to critically assess, I guess, what is impacting your ability and your wellness. Thanks, Holly. So I was frantically taking notes during that one because that was brilliant. Normally, I include the, the ethical space framework, and I've, I've neglected it, but I think I'll add it into the slide deck for the archive. Um, often it's called two-eyed seeing. So it's about the here's the Western models, here's non-Western models, and here's that parallel pathway. And two-eyed seeing is seeing and valuing them both equally. And that's the potential for change. And that's why we're talking about this as a, I know you're waiting for all the exciting access stuff and that's coming next, but this framework is critically important because after doing 20 years of national disability arts domain development, I can tell you that 99% um, of my racialized indigenous colleagues don't feel welcome in the disability arts domain. We have, um, the more it's become funded and the more it's become reduced to just the A and the EDIA, the more we're reinforcing Western models and the less we're creating space for non-Western models. So I want to promote, we want to provide this framework as DMAC to remember that we also, even though we are members of an oppressed community group, we also have responsibilities to all protected classes of people and to be inclusive of our diverse peers. Okay, thank you for that, Holly. I'm going to change the slide. So here's where it all comes together. And this is where stage left tends to approach disability as a holistic thing. So people talk about intersectionalism. This is the framework that allows you to get there. This, this is where every, us white old settler allies, where we can find our way into this collectivism, individualism and collectivism, where everybody, we can find our way into the disability community by looking at it as not as I am disabled or I am not, I experience these social determinants of health in these ways. So you look at health services, you have a lack of access. If you have a lack of access to health services, you have an increased prevalence or severity of illness. And it doesn't matter if you're white, if you're black, if you're indigenous, but what does matter is that we do see in black indigenous racialized communities are the communities that tend to have an increased prevalence of lack of access. So that's where that social equality comes into it. So I would encourage all of us who are looking at access to start using this framework. Do we have access to housing? Do we have access to culture? What about to gender resources and gender and sexuality resources? So all aspects of our disability. So I am a disabled person, but I'm also female. I'm also gender non-conforming. I'm also undereducated. I'm also working class. So when I work in the disability community, I shouldn't have to take off all those other aspects of my identity. Just as Holly, when she comes to work at Stage Life, shouldn't have to just be the white part of her, her Métis identity. And we, needs to be, we need to be all of who we are. And this is a framework that allows us as including and inclusive individuals to attend to that and understand that it, this model of disability affects all of us. Okay, so that's our fundamental framework. And now let's get to the nitty gritty, I think. It's, yes, end of part three. Okay, so this is the part you've all been waiting for. There are millions of free resources available to you. And my number one, sorry, I'll just move on. But this is the most important thing. Um, when you are, again, this is the framework for access. Remember that the most important thing we can provide for anybody in access when we're talking about accessibility is cultural safety. And this is a summary of everything that Holly has summarized and all that we talked about. So cultural safety happens by forming partnerships, not by including one-off. Oh, I'm going to, we're going to include disabled people this month and we're going to include black people this month. We're going to partner with diverse communities to diversify all of our programming. So it's also about your personal knowledge, how much critical consciousness, how much work have you done on yourself to know where do you have privilege? Where do you lack privilege? And where does that come into those power dynamics that Holly was talking about? 
What are the protocols? How do you show respect for the people you're being inclusive of? How do you elicit permissions? Can I use this knowledge? This is part of what I've invited Holly to join me for is this is giving me permission to talk about the teachings I've received. So it's part of the protocol of getting informed consent and making sure that I'm not misrepresenting 30 years of teachings because that would suck. Um, and then there's also the process. How do you go about ensuring equity and dignity for everybody? And so it's just, again, another reminder to think about this, not just in terms of, of disability in this one flatted, flattened way, but to expand the spectrum of disability. And the most important thing in all of this is positive purpose. Please don't try to be inclusive just because we have to be inclusive. <laughs> and yeah, I know you all know that now, but it's building on the strengths of disabled people. It's not they're incapable. We're bringing a unique aesthetic. We're bringing a unique body of knowledge to you when you are inclusive of us. And again, there's the fundamental principle always that is terrifying us all right now, as Holly references, the fear of doing harm. If I use an Indigenous health framework, am I being culturally appropriative? You know, and that and that's part of the reason why you're on the call today, Holly. I have that fear too. Is it okay for me to, as a white person to be speaking about all of this stuff that I'm not belonging to? So I'm projecting that fear right now. So it's always there, but this is a framework for us to start having the confidence to deal with it. Okay, having said all of that, here's the stuff you've all been waiting for, I hope. Here we go. So here's the access stuff. And I'm not going to explain all this in detail because I'm sure you know about it. And so many of our peers. Um, oh, I'll just mention it. If you want to find anything to do with disability, just Google Disability Theater Canada. I did that and there are 29 pages of hits on Google search. So the, every one of those theater companies has developed their own access guide. So my point is all of this information is available to for free. You can find it, we'll link to it, we'll give it all to you. So I'm just gonna summarize this, but these are the big ones. So for neurodiverse, so basically neurodiverse is a middle-class way of saying autistic. Um, so if you are autistic, you're on the Asperger spectrum, uh, or if you are mad, if you have learning disabilities like mine, that's also a form of neurodiversity. Mad person meaning um, mentally ill or having mental health struggles, or just having depression, and, and I say others because none of these are mutually exclusive. If you're physically disabled, you still might benefit from relaxed performances. Anyway, so relaxed performances from a patron perspective, I'm not autistic, but I absolutely love relaxed performances because you can't see me, all of me right now, but I wear shorts and t-shirts 352 days of the year. And when I go to the theater, I want to stay in my shorts and t-shirts, but I'm not sure I can. So when somebody's having a relaxed performance, I love going because I can show up in my shorts and t-shirts and I can take my socks and shoes off. So basically when you're doing a relaxed performance, you're saying, come as you are completely as you are, and we will meet you where you are at. So we will leave the house lights on. We will smell Michelle's stinky feet for two hours. We will let these really smart youth with autism give the shout out advice to the characters. <laughs> was, that was my very first disability art show. We had an, we did it for an autism community and every single member of the audience was like, why are you behaving like that? That's, she did it, she did it. Like they solved the, the murder mystery on act one and they were shouting advice for the other two acts and the actors were just having, so that's why I added actors need to be prepped accordingly. <laughs> so it's a fun improv, it's a, wonderful challenge as an actor it brings you back to life because suddenly a boring old performance you've done for five weeks and counting it puts you on your toes so basically it's just and it's not just people with disabilities if you're a parent and you have a small baby that's going to cry and you have a uh, people who are going to be grumpy about that the working class like i mentioned you know people who like to be in shorts and t-shirts the gender diverse those of us who don't fit into society we're welcome at relaxed performances I'm going to move on. So from the from a producer perspective, it's a whole other thing. I recommend rather than just chill room. So, hey, go off into this quiet space and sit. That will actually make some people more anxious. Give them things to do. So add sensory stimulation rooms as well. So don't just say go off and have quiet space here. Here's some Legos. Here's things to touch. Here's fuzzy what are those called? Fake fur things. Here's things to take all that energy that's building up with you and put it out there. So if you can get that energy out of you, then maybe you can come back into the theater. So as 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 a um, producer, think about what might be going on for your patrons. They're building up tension because they're uncomfortable with things. So rather than exploding that outward, which it'll happen, give them a chance to, to decompress in different ways. 
So for, you have to familiar, so, uh, familiarize yourselves with the triggers. So sometimes it's too much darkness. So I leave the house lights on. Um, it's too loud of music. You know, if you have a lightning cue, just tone it down. Because that, if, if you, especially if you have people with Williams syndrome, sudden surprises. I did a workshop with 200 kids with Williams syndrome and we did a clapping game. And on the first clap, they all just collapsed because loud sounds. They just can't handle it. And I had no idea. I'm like, why is everybody in the, in the you know, ducking cover position? And it's like, oh, it's a, it's a, so, and you can't learn this stuff unless you play with people, unless you gain experiential understanding, but you can do so by reaching out to service providers. If you know you're going to be working with an actor who has Williams syndrome, for example, reach out to the Williams syndrome association. Every disability service provider in the country, you know, I used to be one of them, I worked for the CP Association in Alberta, we developed our own engagement guides. Here's how you non-disabled, us non-disabled people, here's how we engage with people with CP. It, so that's what my job was. I wrote a 75 page inclusive engagement guide. So they're available to you. So if you know you're including somebody with Downs, you're gonna be collaborating, talk to the Down Syndrome Association. They're paid to give you this advice and to be cultural liaisons. And anyway, so the other thing you need to do is change your show. You have to adjust the tech. So quieter music, reducing loud sounds, slowing your lighting cues, all of, you have to be prepared and you have to prepare not just your actors, but your tech team and your stage manager to call a slower show and eliminate strobe effects and all of those things. The number one resource in the country right now for relaxed performances is a company in Calgary. They're called Inside Out Theater and they have a program called the good host program. So if you want to do a relaxed performance, they have resources available for you. Holly, anything you want to add? Yeah, something I, that just popped into my brain as you were speaking about the, the different types of sensory stimulation rooms and spaces and that energetic release that you get um, is a concept I was just introduced to recently. So I don't know tons about it yet, but just started learning. But um, it's this idea of babbling and doodling as um, often when we when there's something that we need to release or process or deal with, um, there's different variations of babbling and doodling. And I've, I've started thinking about my, when, when I need those moments of release, how can I doodle in different domains? Um, so like physical doodling, like sometimes I need to pace it up, pace around and think out what I'm feeling and think out you know, what's going on to, in order to have that energetic release and come back to what's going on um, versus like actual doodling, like maybe it's an artistic release I need. And so I've started, you know, when I'm struggling to process or handle a certain situation, find my different ways of doodling. And I think that kind of translates nicely into different types of sensory rooms or stimulation spaces for those chill rooms. Thanks for that, Holly. I forgot to mention too that sometimes during relaxed performances, we'll have a pause in the performance and we'll do like a three minute physical exercise. Like let's all run on the spot now. And so that we can, if you've got a lot of people who have ADHD, they've taken all that energy and you give them a chance to blow it out. So basically relaxed performance means giving as many opportunities to your patrons as possible to be who they are and however they need to be. So you're gonna have lots of kids with autism swinging back and forth and being very distracting, but it's just an absolute joy. It, I suggest you have a feast and invite everybody. Like it's an absolute joy. I've never experienced the community essence of theater more than during relaxed performances. And you're inviting a whole new group of patrons in, into your theater and making them feel welcome. Like it's an absolute joy. Okay, relaxed performances. Then the other thing you can do is this thing called social stories or sometimes they're called visual stories. A lot of people are afraid to go into society. People have been shunned by society. They're afraid to show up. And if they don't know, they've never gone to the theater before and they don't, the, the anxiety of not knowing will make them not want to come and it heightens those anxieties. So what you can do is you can record what's called a visual story and you can just narrate a description of what it's going to be like. Or you can even film one with your iPhone. Just here, okay, so now I'm driving to the theater and here's, here's the parking lot and here's all the buildings that are around you so you don't have to worry about what's behind you you're not going to get mugged or you know and here here's the here's the accessible handy uh sorry the handicapped parking spaces and here's so here's where you can park and here now we're walking into the theater and now here's the box office and here's the bathrooms and here's all all the things and so basically you can just record a short video two three minutes put it on your website in your show description where all your bios are and all the patrons have to do is hit play and they get to see know in advance what they're about to come into. 
And it also gives your staff a chance also to form relationships because you can host parties, you can host pre-tours with people and you can do a live social tour where your front of house team meets. Like for example, if you offer a house to a service provider, uh, I used to do this. It was a CP Association's 20th anniversary. I'm like, why don't you come to the theater as a, for free and see a show that night? So we did a social story. We brought the whole group, the whole house, all 200 people. We walked them through the theater in advance. And it was really, it really helped just calm everybody down. So there's relaxed performances and then there's social stories. So giving people a chance to know what's going to happen before it happens to them. And then there's these things called touch tours. And these are also for blind, visually impaired people. A touch tour is literally, or I think this might have, should have said blind people because mostly it's used for the blind, but we started using them for people who are neurodiverse and hypersensitive. So a touch tour is literally 45 minutes between the show. If you want to come in, we'll give you access to the house. You can touch, go up on stage, touch the props, touch. So basically it's for people with low vision, um, people who are hypersensitive, they can feel the set. They can get an understanding of the spatial relationships. They can get an understanding of the power dynamics. Like, oh, just by touching the costumes, they know which characters are mean and evil. It's pretty interesting. I haven't figured out why, but they can always tell who, who the bad guys are by touching the costumes. It's amazing. Anyway, so another example of doing that is this thing called tactile model boxes. So when your set designer builds your scale model of the set, you can ask them to do it twice. So you have one that you archive, of course, and then you have another one you make available to your patrons so they can look at it in advance and they can touch it and they can understand how your scene changes might work and they can get a visual and a sensory understanding of the show before they see it. Okay, Nolly, anything? You good? Okay. So again, moving into visually impaired and it's a spectrum because most of those things also apply to the blind and the visually impaired. There's an agency called Vocal Eyes. They were developed in London, England in the 1998, I think, but we actually have a Vancouver chapter, but they meet the needs of blind, low vision, visually impaired patrons. And, and it's brilliant. They've developed some of the best technology available to us in the theater sector. So if you want to include visually impaired patrons and want advice on how reach out to Vocalize in Vancouver, they're, they're an absolutely brilliant team. So they've developed Vocalize in London and the Vocalize team internationally developed this thing called audio description. It's basically an oral depiction or an oral narration of the action and the visual elements of the play. So you can pre-record it. And then you can provide your blind patients listening devices so that they can, as they're watching live, they can be listening to the audio description so they can hear what's going on. You'll see this often now when you're watching TV, there's closed captioning and there's also an option for audio description for people now. So it's been integrated into the mass society and it's amazing. So you can pre-record your audio descriptions. You can do it live in the part of the show for the whole audience. You can, so that instead of just the blind people, you can make everybody listen to the audio description as well. And you can foster a disability culture environment in the house, or you can do it live and you can have live audio descriptors available to your blind patrons. And they will literally then sit beside the blind person in the audience and they will describe the action to them while you're watching the play. This one, to be all honest, pisses off your other patrons a lot because they want to come and they want to focus on the show. And maybe they have visual, they have other disabilities and they can't do it if somebody beside them is whispering all the time. So if you're going to invite live audio description, you might want to create a section in the house for it so that the other people around them don't get their backs up because somebody's talking the whole time. Because we have trained our audiences, of course, to be polite during a show. So other people get their backs up for you. So people from 10 rows away will be like, be quiet, be quiet. And they don't realize that the audio descriptioners are providing a service. So you need to make your house available. I mean, aware of the fact that there's audio descriptioning happening. So nobody gets shamed in that process. So you can also do audio promotion, just like you can do a visual tour, a visual depiction of here's how you come into the theater. You can, all, all your, everything you put on your flyer, you can say out loud and you can, so blind patrons can, what's this show about? They, they don't, instead of reading it, they can just hit a button and hear it. So again, you can, it's not that hard to do. It's just like, it's a, it's an oral form of ASL. <laughs> okay. So that's audio promotion. And then there's this thing called alt tags and that's in digital promotion on your websites now and all digital things here on what's this software called Adobe Pro. There's always this option on every image. Now you can click and you can choose to add this thing called alt tag. So it's an alternative 
JPEGs, I guess. So you can just put a visual, an oral description, an audio description of digital images. So blind people can't see the pictures of the cast or of the show, but you can describe it to them in words and they can access that information. Okay, Holly, anything else? Hey, thank you. We'll move on. So then there's here some guidelines if you're using print. So for your programs, if any of us are printing programs still, those of us who are part of the bigger houses and have budgets to do so, here are some print guidelines for the blind. Use large print, use high contrast, avoid italics and other forms of serif fonts, especially handwriting fonts. Serif fonts are the cur curly ones like Times New Roman versus Helvetica. You want to use a Helvetica or an Arial font when you're creating um, accessibility in print. And then you want to avoid using all caps for long periods of time as well. And there's a whole other guide, but it's 20 pages long. So we'll provide a link to text guidelines in large print and signage. And this is important for your signage. When people are blind, you know your blind patrons and others are coming, make sure they know you have directional, large print directional signs to the bathrooms, to the bar, to, to all the spaces that your patrons can see and get to otherwise. And it doesn't have to be words. You can also use symbols. You know, there's the bathroom symbol, there's the bar symbols. So it doesn't always have to be a big, large print text heavy thing. You can use symbols. Okay, so also the other thing is avoid putting text over images. It's just ridiculously hard to see if there's two layers of processing. Try not to use glossy print use or low weight paper because it just rips and tears as people are trying to use it. And fold, if you're folding your programs, make sure that it doesn't hide the text in the folds. And oh, the other thing to say is when you're doing digital promotion, don't send your stuff out with PDFs in them or embedded JPEG images because they don't work with screen readers. Or if you do, provide a plain text option so because that works with screen readers. So that's why if any of you are on the receiving end of our Step Right Up promotions right now that we're doing for our Disability Theater Symposium that's coming up, we have a JPEG version of it, we have a PDF version, we have a plain text version. So because our we have so many people with so many different kinds of disabilities. And that's also why we don't use at Stage Left, we don't use something like MailChimp with those HTML templates because they're also not compatible with screen readers. So when our blind patrons and our members look at them, it's just gobbledygook. So you think you're creating a nice, beautiful, easily accessible newsletter, but you're creating one that shows up as gunk on the other end because of accessibility softwares and incompatibility. Okay, so high contrast guidelines for directionals. The other thing you can do in the theater itself is use reflective tape or twinkle lights. I did all my disability arts festivals in the Big Secret Theater in Calgary, and they have an old spiral staircase and poor blind actors. The only thing that saved them from plummeting down that staircase was the fact that we put twinkle lights everywhere. And we didn't care that it spilled out into the theater a little bit. Like, who cares? It's better that she didn't tumble down those stairs. So reflective tape or twinkle lights also down the aisle ways. So for the patrons, they can get to their seats or stairways so they can find where they're seating. If you know you have two patrons coming, highlight their seats for them put glow tape on the back of them so they can see that those, those are their seats rather than having to go like this to see the seat numbers that are only this big. Okay, so the other thing, and this is expensive again, so you come up against limits of undue hardship, but if you, can, if you have an elevator in your building, if it can have those things that say level two, level one, ding, 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 or if you have a braille for the numbers, that, that's a high uh, cost investment, but if you can have those kind of those, are, that's what spoken descriptors are. You know, when you're crossing the street, that beep, 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 when you're waiting, those are spoken descriptors for the blind to know when it's safe to cross the street or not. So you can have things like that in your parking lot. So they just you can use sound to direct people. So you can have a parking lot sound. Here's the accessible park, and you go beep 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 all the way into the lobby. So you can rig a series of little speakers especially with the technology and the affordability of it. So people can follow a sound pathway into the house. So those are examples of directional accessibility. Okay. Okay, keep going. So now we're on to the deaf, hard of hearing and others, people like me who are becoming deaf and are, can't learn ASL fast enough. <laughs> so here's an example. The first one, we have two interpreters, Rachel and Sue, thank you very much. I hope I'm not speaking too quickly for you. So we have American Sign Language. And that's the example of Rachel and Sue are doing that right now for us. But also because we are officially multi bilingual country, it's also French Sign Language, but I can't speak Canadian French, but it's a French Sign Language. That's all. Can anybody on the call speak French and want to say it out loud for me? 
anyway, so that's the abbreviation for, but this, oh, it's the language designing of Quebec. So this is specific to Quebec and Canadian sign language. So we have a, in French sign language is different than Quebec sign language, I promise you that. And then the other thing is again, because we have a, for original peoples in Canada, indigenous peoples here also have their own signed or symbolic languages. So for example, the Inuit, my colleague, uh, Milena Sheldon reminded me that the Inukshuks that we all like to pick up in airports now, little <laughs> gifts, Inukshuks, but that's a form of, of symbolic communication. That's how in, in, in communities communicated with people, in their own communities and other communities across vast terrains of, of, of snow and landscape. That's how we, it's, so it's a symbolic communication system. So when we're talking about ASL, we have to remember it's not just English, or French, it's also many, every indigenous culture that I've encountered, and there's been quite a few, has an, a kind of signed or symbolic language. And often it's just a simple thing like this. Like that's, I don't know what it means, but I've seen that a lot. <laughs> Holly, anything you wanna comment on there? Um, I guess my context would be, there's a lot that can be said with just a pointing of the lips or a pursing <laughs> of the lips versus yeah. having to use your words. Yeah, and if you're not part of that culture, you won't you won't understand what that means. But it is it's very specific. <laughs> Thank you for that. So this is again specific to deaf actors. Deaf actors, we're seeing Chris Dodd is doing a deaf uh, sound off festival. Um, so we're seeing a lot of performances now that are happening with deaf actors in sign language interpreting. So the the ways in which you can make your show accessible is to hire deaf actors and they will sign their lines. So that's one way period, instead of signing hearing, I mean, hiring hearing actors, just hire a deaf actor who speaks ASL and have it interpreted. And all of a sudden your show's accessible to the deaf, or you can engage as Brad has done for us today. Thankfully, you can engage sign language interpreters. They come in teams because it's an exhausting process. So you will always engage two, at least two at a time. Um, and in every city you are pr producing work, you just reach out to the Deaf Cultural Association in that city and they will have a list of interpreters. But one thing to consider with all due respect and it's fine on this call, uh, this is not a slight in any way, but if you are producing a show with indigenous actors, it's sometimes welcoming to hire an indigenous interpreter or a black interpreter or hire an interpreter from within the community that you're engaged with. And, they, they, and that's why I recommend you go to the Deaf Associations because they have, a vast list of resources that we won't know about. So the other way, if you can't manage ASL, um, you can do captioning. And that's just the words printed out. We know this from uh, closed captioning for the deaf on our televisions. So you have captioning. So it's live captioning, where you literally have somebody live, they're called, formerly they're called pal and typists, but none of us can remember that. So we just call them captioners now. So you're literally in live time because you know a theater performance is never the same twice. So this is how you can actually get the improv moments and you can get the, the actual accuracy of the show that's happening live is to have a live captioner. So when the actors go off book and are having fun or playing a moment really well and they change the language, you, you can bring your deaf audience with you on those wonderful moments that actors nail. Um, if you can't do um, live captioning, you can do text-based captioning. So um, Google Translate for is an example of it. And as it's becoming more and more popular, these technologies, these automatic speech recognition softwares are actually becoming far more accurate, except when you're dealing with people who speak as quickly as I do, <laughs> or people, for example, like my colleague, Alan Shane, who has cerebral palsy and has dysarthria, or, or quote unquote, the CP accent. But, um, so there, but there are free ones available. Microsoft has one, Apple has one. You just have to train them. It's a AI, what's it called? Artificial intelligence. Yeah, we have, you have to train them to respond to that act actor's particular voice, but they're available and it's for free. And then there's these things called TTY. So if for your box office and people are trying to call and reserve tickets in order to be able to speak to a deaf patron, you need to have a TTY device to do so. And then the thing to think about, just as we talked about thinking about cultural diversity as an overall thing, when you're working in the deaf community, you wanna think about this thing called deaf space. So you wanna hire potentially or talk with and engage a deaf cultural advisor. So do, when you're working in deaf communities, they arrange the space differently. So we might have a meeting, a theater meeting like this presentation, here's me and I'm facing everybody else and everybody's facing me. In a deaf community, you mostly you'll see a circle of people so that everybody can see everybody else. So because deaf is not an orally based language, 
excuse me, it's a visually based language. People, the way in which space gets arranged, it gets arranged visually and also in with respect to touch. So the spatial awareness and orientation changes profoundly how you set up your room, how you create your set and your blocking. If you have a deaf space connotation and ethos that will profoundly change the way you approach directing a show as well with deaf actors. Okay. Interpreters, do you want to add? I know you're interpreting, but you are agents of a deaf community. And I'm sorry if I'm crossing any kind of professional boundary, but I'm inviting you to comment if there's anything you want to add to interpreting Sue and or Rachel. Any comment? Okay, thank you. I just wanted to be respectful, and I know I crossed a boundary there. Normally, you don't ever invite the, the but we have people who are part of the community, and I try to break down those power barriers, and I'm sorry if I put you in an awkward position. Okay. So here, PDD community, this is where Stage Life started out for the first 10 years and we've never ever stopped. PDD means persons with developmental disabilities. I think in other provinces in Alberta, it might be called persons with intellectual disabilities but, or people with learning disabilities, but this is PDD. So basically when you're dealing with people with developmental disabilities, you have to think about accessible communication forms. So, and I don't mean dumbing it down. I mean, making language genuinely accessible. So you're not, I, I teach, I do, I'm, we're a theater of the oppressed company. And I promise you that every person with a disability, developmental disability that has participated in stage left, they can define oppression. I'm not gonna not use the word. I'm going to use multiple options. Maybe what's oppression, bullying, uh, feeling, getting picked on. So, but you don't take the oppression part out of it because you're presuming that they can't know it. So that's what, it, don't dumb it down because you're presuming that people with disabilities don't have the intelligence. So we've developed an entire system to prevent that and it's called plain language and it's a trademark. You have to actually train in order to do plain language, you have to take an accredited course to become a plain language facilitator. And it is very specific, but it is very profound. The first few shows I did, I had to learn to write scripts and direct in plain language, but it did it when I learned it and me and the actors were developmentally disabled, when we finally were actually communicating, wow, did the show come to life? So it's because if before that I was trying to dumb it down and they weren't understanding, it's like, why is Michelle being so patronizing? <laughs> so we couldn't form that bond and that relationship of trust until I learned how to use plain language. Okay, so here are the principles. I'm not going to read them all out loud because the slide deck will be available to you. And so will a plain language resource. Um, the other thing that the PDD community, they come with others. So don't, please don't have closed rehearsals when you're working with PDD community because PDD comes with care networks and that's a support team. And they're there to help you. They're not there to interfere with you. They're not there to critique you. They're there to help the person advocate, the disabled actor advocate for themselves. And that's a difficult process, I promise you. So the care network can include parents, they will often include parents, even if the actor's 50 years old. If those parents remain that per that child's, child's guardian, they are still a caretaker and part of that person's care network. You get into a power dynamic there where the, where the child the, wants to do one thing and the parents want to do something else. So you have to learn to navigate that and empower the individual. But parents become, in the PDD community, you will be dealing with parents even if the person are 50, 60 years old. They also have community support workers. PDD people come just like the deaf community comes with ASL interpreters available to us. We have community support workers available to us when we're working with PDD actors and patrons. So when, if a person with a disability wants to come as a patron, they're gonna need three seats probably because their support workers are gonna be coming with them. So there's also guardians. So sometimes actors and, and patrons with developmental disabilities, they can't legally sign for themselves. So you have to develop relationships with their guardians. So when you're doing engagement agreements, you have to bring their guardians into those conversations. They have, because the guardian's gonna be signing for the client, the client in the PDD community, in the actor or the patron. So, and also you have trustees, same thing. If um, you're engaging a, an actor with a PDD, chances are they have a trustee because if we pay them a scale, equity scale, they're gonna lose their pensions in most cases. So in many times it's helpful to have a trustee. So the trustee receives the fees so that the PDD person and the person who's on a disability pension, they have separate forms of funding and we don't mess up the long-term life 
wellness plans of the artists with disability. And we are, as DMEC, we have been fighting for 20 years for grants. I mean, tech, yeah, great. what are they called? Yeah, grants, arts-based grants that go out to people with disabilities who are on pensions to not be grants, but to be tax-free disbursements because that's a, creating a huge barrier right now to accessibility. Okay, so that's care networks. And also you're gonna see disability advocates like me. Like I get called on the most through DMAC to be advocates for artists with disabilities because what we're seeing is uh, many times people's rights are not being upheld, but people don't feel confident enough to advocate for themselves. So they'll call on DMAC and say, can you come to this meeting with me so I can raise these concerns? And it's not a complaint. It's nothing bad happening. It's just cultural differences. We're just working across culture. We just have to remember that there's different ways of engaging people and accessibility is part of that. Okay, moving on. So, and then we're moving on to the end. Um, sorry, I have not been inclusive. As I've talked about, you know, disability by disability, these are just some of the many other things available. So that's when the resources come, you'll, you'll, I'll open that up for you. So here's some examples. When you're working with the physically disabled, um, you're gonna be encountering a lot of these things called aids to daily living. So whether it's your audience members or your colleagues as actors, directors, they're gonna be coming with mobility devices. And that can include different forms of wheelchairs. There are power wheelchairs, there are uh, manual wheelchairs, there are scooters. So there are many different types of mobility aids. There are walkers, there are leg braces, there are XYZs. Then you also, those wheelchairs and other things will come with voice or head controls. So if people don't have the ability to drive their, uh, what do they call wheelchairs with their hands, they might have a voice control or a head control. Um, if people have head controls, they're not gonna be recording their blocking in the same way. They're gonna be doing it one, not at a time on a keyboard potentially. So you might need to have uh, um, some, in, some support care network people there to be taking notes for people. So it's not just aids to daily living, it's also support workers. So, but there's typing aids. So there's adapted keyboards. If you're working based on, compu on computers or you're working over Zoom, people will need adapted technologies to engage in that. There are reachers and grab bars so people don't have to get up and get things they can. So, and when you're directing, you might need to be learning how to integrate all of these things into your blocking. These things called gate belts for people who have um, um, to stand upright. They have different types of things that have to get integrated into your costumes. Um, there's door stops, so even though you can open a bathroom by hitting a switch, that door closes and then people can't get out again. So people might come with door stops that they have to wedge under bathroom doors so they can get in to pee and also get back into rehearsal afterward. Um, so there's anyway, there's so your stage management team and your front of house team has to be prepared because sometimes people will come in their chair and want to transfer as patrons into their theater seat. So your your front of house team also has to learn how to drive power wheelchairs. So if the person transfers, you have to park their chair somewhere out of the way. Legally, you have to move these devices. If you wreck them, you're on. It's a seven, 10, 12, $20,000 charge. So you might wanna train your front of house team and how to manage these devices. Anyway, then some actors and some patrons with disabilities will come with communication devices. So if people have permanent tracheotomies or are nonverbal, they will come with these things called reader boards. So you'll ask them a question and they will type an answer and then a board will speak their answer to you. So you have to learn to, to allow that slowness of communication at different pace and to give people a chance to articulate themselves. Uh, people who have per, um, permanent tracheotomies, they use things called speech vents. So sometimes they, when you're talking to people, they might have to adjust the vents. And so you just, when people are talking differently or using an interpreter, whether it's an ASL interpreter or a different kind of spoken interpreter, you just have to adapt your pace of speaking and meet the person where they're at. So, oh, here's my, sorry, I accidentally put this one in twice. Dining aids, so when you're having your lunch with your cast, you might see people using adapted cutlery and they'll come with a whole kit and you might need to create space in the kitchen for all these things and to be properly sanitized as well. Um, people with disabilities, we come with medications. I have to give myself injections on a fairly regular basis. It's always helpful if I have a safe place to dispose of them in the toilet. Otherwise I have to come out of the toilet and I have to declare to everybody that I just had to do an injection. And the number of times I've been accused of shooting up drugs in certain public spaces as a result of that is just humiliating. So if you, if you can create a safe dis disposal thing in the toilet that just prevents humiliation for people that you have to use things like sharps. Sharps are needles, by the way. 
Um, other, if you're on tour with people or you might have audience people, members, patrons who have trouble breathing, um, CPAP machines usually are people that help people not suffocate in their sleep to keep their airways open, but it's not just in your sleep. Sometimes patrons will come with CPAP machines and they make sounds, so you will hear them. You'll, it's not like as much as a ventilator or a respirator, but sometimes you can hear sounds happening. Um, and, but if you are taking a person on tour that uses a CPAP machine, you have a legal and an ethical and a moral responsibility to make sure you know how to keep it running, okay, especially if you're not bringing that care network with that person, because so if they can't actually are not physically capable of maintaining that equipment, somebody on your team has to be able to do it for them. Okay, and then there's also toileting aids and accessible toilets. So a lot of people will have come with adult pads. Um, please make sure there's places to dispose of them in the toilets. Otherwise, they, again, people have to come out with this diaper. You, you, oh, you're 40 years old and you use a diaper. So you end up creating opportunities for people to get shamed. Some people will come with a commode. So when you are hiring actors and are people with physical disabilities, they might need a commode to, to use the toilet during intermission. So if that's the case, you need a place to store it. You need also a, a reserve stall so that they have a chance to pee before intermission's over. You need to jump people to the front of the line, things like that. And that's why we talked at the beginning about these relational models of disability. The more you develop relationships with disabled patrons and, and the disabled members of your constituency groups, the easier this stuff becomes to navigate. Like I know now that my colleague comes with XYZ and I'm not scared of it anymore. I know that I'm gonna have to be cleaning these things. I'm gonna have to provide. And, and um, COVID has helped us a lot with that. We've become so much more conscious of sanitizing and, and cleanliness and not sharing germs now that it should just be second nature to us. But just remember that when people with physical disabilities come, we might have to be involved in some of this intimacy of support care, especially if we don't let their care networks come with them. And those care networks will include personal care attendants. So for example, I'm going to Victoria on June 1st and spending three weeks in rehearsal with a physically disabled actor and he will have a personal care attendant with him at all times. So that person will help them eat, that person will help them go to the toilet and all those things. But what I can't do is talk to the personal care attendant rather than the artist. It's critically important. That personal care attendant works for the disabled artist. They don't work for you. And it is absolutely humiliating to, to ask the personal care attendant person to speak for the disabled artist. So please don't ever do that. Ask permission of the disabled artist. Can I engage with your personal care attendant? Ask them some questions and get permission first. Just like with a seeing eye dog. Oh, I forgot to mention that in the blind. With they, here, seeing eye dogs is also a mobility device. So there's not just seeing eye dogs now, they're seeing eye horses, miniature horses, because they live longer. You know, otherwise you have a blind person who's having to retrain their staff, their dog staff every six years. Horses live 30 years. So we're seeing a lot of miniature horses being trained as seeing eye dogs now. Anyway, so, okay. So yeah, personal care attendants, when you're bringing a care network with you, it's still critically important to empower the, the disabled artist or the disabled patron. Okay. Holly, I'm just racing through all this. So do you, do you wanna jump in anywhere on anything? No, I think I'm good right now. I'm also just learning a lot myself. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks. Any questions, Brad and team? No, we're good. Okay, I'll, let me just go on and then I'll let you summarize everything at the end there, Brad. Sorry, I just want to make sure we're close to the end. Yes, end of part four. Okay, so just a couple of things I want to touch on is um, access for disabled artists. So a lot of the time we're including disabled people, but we're not treating them as disabled artists. So I wanted to remind us all of the legal duty to accommodate. This is labor law. It's our labor code. It's our responsibility. Anytime you're engaging a person, whether they are their legal guardian or not, it doesn't matter. We are obligated to protect all classes of people. So it's not just people with disabilities. It's any, any protected classes of people. But in this context, we're focusing on impairment. But I want to stress that again, because how you accommodate the person is going to be dependent on all of their culture. So if it's a black disabled person, some of the cultural stuff is going to have to be a consideration in all of this. Anyway, so the legal duty to accommodate is basically is to say, if I'm hiring a disabled person and part of the job requirement is to lift 200 pound boxes, if you can get somebody else to lift those 200 pound boxes, but that disabled person then can do another part of that, you can trade responsibilities. So rather than not hiring a disabled person, you just say to employee number two, 
okay, you're going to be responsible for lifting boxes now. And before you were taking minutes of the meeting. So now the disabled employee will do minutes and you'll do heavy lifting. So you're just trading things off. It's as simple as that. That's how you can be inclusive and how you can accommodate somebody. On the other hand, and we see this a lot in stage left, we are a woefully underfunded company on the margins. And when I invite artists with disabilities to send me their list of accommodations, they often come in at 70 or $80,000, which is almost twice our annual budget in some cases. So the legal duty to accommodate is limited by this thing called undue hardship. Can you afford it? So suddenly I'm working with a physically disabled actor and he can't do stairs but I can't afford to put an elevator in. That's a $200,000 expense. None of us can, especially in the arts, <laughs> as if any of us can afford that. So that's a point of undue hardship. You, you have a legal right to say, I'm sorry, we can't accommodate you because we don't have the resources to do so. So if it's an intolerable financial cost or if it causes a serious disruption to the business itself. So if you had to close your doors for a year to renovate, but you lot, the year of lost revenue would cause the business to close, then you have to put a limit on the, the accommodations that are being requested. That's all. And usually your, uh, your employees with disabilities are pretty flexible about that. But we, what we have seen though, is because everything in disability arts has been reduced to the A, the EDIA, access, 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 what most people are advocating for is every ounce of access they can get. So we are seeing access requests that are coming in at $70,000. And there is a more affordable way to do things, I promise you, for those of us who are less resourced. Okay, that's on due hardship. So again, just a reminder that when you're engaging artists with disabilities, we're still obligated to meet them and follow the reciprocal agreements in the theater sector, which is our industry standards, AKA the Canadian Theater Agreement. So we still need to honor the professional codes of conduct. We still need to honor the rates of pay, the daily working hours and the Canadian, and I'm really thrilled to say that the Canadian Actors' Equity Association has been incredibly responsive to our demands. You know, we, the CTA was like, okay, we're gonna work from, because I used to be a stage manager. So as I was working here, you get this 15 minutes off here are the hours and with everything was so regulated, but now they've developed the indie and a flexible rehearsal model. So it's okay, we'll work two hours in the morning, then we'll take a break and we'll do our recovery and then we'll come back in the afternoon. So even the Canadian Actors Equity Association has developed the flexibility needed to be accommodating. And why I'm mentioning all this is because the number one complaint that DMAC is getting right now is that our industry standards are not being upheld when people are engaging disabled artists. We're not treating them as peers or as colleagues. We're treating them as human rights interests. So for example, we see, I don't know, I think I have about 400 bookmarks right now of examples where the artists with disabilities have been credited as artists with disabilities. So how would any of us feel if I credited my cast as actors with blue eyes? Like it's an absolutely violation of industry protocols not to credit every year or your artist by name. So why do we think it's okay to say artists with disabilities rather than Jerry and Joe and Julie? And sometimes you can't. If they're you're working with protected classes of people, sometimes they can't use their full names for all the reasons that are necessary in safeguarding, but you can still say Joe. You can still say, or you can still invite them to make up a stage name. Well, lots of us do it. <laughs> we all have stage names. So if you can't use a person's legal name for reasons of trustee, guardianship, all the things that happen legally, you can just, hey, what, what do you want your stage name to be? So my point is, please just respect us as artists rather than just as human rights and diversity concerns. Okay, I think we're almost there. There's one thing that I want to talk about in, in the professionalism, and that's this idea of informed consent. I don't know how many disabled artists have reached out to DMAC um, and they've been signed into contracts and they have no understanding of what they've been signed, what they've agreed to. So they, you, they, somebody signs them and then they come right to DMAC to say, so what does any of this mean? I'm like, why did you sign if you don't know what it means? So there's this whole process called um, informed consent. And it's a process of creating accessible inclusion, equitable inclusion, sorry. So um, it's usually you have an advocate there and that's what I do for DMAC is I will sit with an artist and the engaging company and we'll just go through the contract line by line. 
and the, the company reads line one. And then I say to the artist, do you, do you understand that? Tell me what you think it means. And then if they're reflecting it back correctly, we move on. If they're reflecting it back incorrectly, we say, okay, here's what I think it means. Yes, director, no, okay, I got it wrong. Could you explain it again? And we until that person understands that line, we don't move on to the next one. It takes hours, but it's awesome because it's just what you do. And the person feels valued as a colleague and they're making an informed consent. So when you're saying, you agreed to this when actors become afraid and don't want to receive directing from you and all their defenses kick in, you can remind them of their contractual obligations and you can be confident they, they agreed to them consensually. Okay. And so here's the last thing I'm just going to leave you with, although I've, somehow I have a few more slides showing, but um, it's the difference between access and accommodation, just attitudinally. Access tends to grant opportunities for artists to engage in artistic production, period. But accommodation is the way the is access that requires the art form and the process of staging it to be altered. So in access, what's happening is we're inviting disabled people in, but we're saying, here's how theater is. So if you want to do theater, you've got to do it this way. So blocking, for example, we all know as directors, we've been trained that the most powerful position for a man could be full front, standing out fully upright, down center. Well, what if your actor can't do that? What if he can't stand up? How do you change the art form? How do you reshape your blocking to still give him the most powerful position on stage when he's on his hands and knees? So that's accommodation. You're changing the form, the process of staging art. You're changing the aesthetics you're, instead of changing the artists. And that's why I often, and I'm, I'm stressing this for a really important reason. So many artists with disabilities have been included and then they feel like failures after they've done the show because they're being assessed by traditional non-disabled aesthetic standards. So people expect to see a ballet, they expect to see a woefully underweight woman in a tutu who's very fit, but very thin, you know, and usually she's gonna be white and she's gonna have blonde hair, but my the ballet active person I work with, he's gay, he's indigenous, but he's female identified. He uses a power wheelchair and he weighs about 400 pounds. But we, we put a tutu on him, but nobody believes he can be a prima ballerina. So we call this the aesthetics of real versus imaginary bodies. So access is, here you go, come and be a theater person. Accommodation, here you go, come and be your unique self as a theater artist. That's a fundamental difference we're talking about in all of this. So again, just cultural considerations. We've talked about this a lot, but I wanna expand it beyond ethnocultural. It's also dress codes, working class. So it's not just if you are a racialized person, an indigenous person, what if you're poor and you can't afford a, a suit and you don't feel like you're entitled to come to the theater? What are your welcoming messages? Are your welcoming messages welcome to, I can't see, stage left, is it in other languages than English? If you put it in indigenous language with the local nations, that's a, besides your land acknowledgement, you're also saying you're welcome here. You can also use symbols, but how do you dress your lobby in a way that people feel welcomed into? Can your disabled artists who are indigenous smudge in your venue? That's gonna be, that's the number one access request stage left gets from indigenous artists. It's not for personal care attendance. It's not for ramps. It's not for ground transportation. It's access to an elder and it's the ability to smudge in a venue. And those are access concerns for them. Those are not generally just cultural concerns. It's in terms of I cannot gain access to this production unless I have these cultural safeties available to me. So um, and again, we've talked about this. Can your care network, will you accept an ability for your care network to intervene? Will you allow that to happen in your process? And have you made cultural liaisons available? So you know you're going to be bringing in some racialized artists. Reach out to the your racialized community groups and the activists and say, here's what we're doing. We're white people. We know we're going to get it wrong. Can you help be a buffer and help make that OK and help in the accountability? And that just creates more safety. So it's just all about creating welcoming, belonging, but these are the nitty gritties of a lot of it. Okay, let me just move on. Yay, okay, we're at the end. And then just a couple of other things, which is really important in my heart because I'm, uh, most of people don't know this because I try not to be braggy and egocentric, but um, I'm the person that built the disability arts domain in Canada. I'm the person that's responsible for disability arts funding and policy in Canada. And the domain that we built from 1970 to 2000 was all about the art. So imagine our sadness, but now it's all about our access. 
So one of the points we always try to make is also, we have to remember that the whole point of the disability arts movement is to create access for art, our artistic practices, not just our identities. We are artists and we want to be treated as artists. So here's just a couple of quick slides on disability aesthetics. If uh, Thanks for indulging me in this. So what we're seeing a lot of the time in non-disability led theater projects that are inclusive are these things called normalized aesthetics. And I just talked about that, the difference between access and accommodation. So this can, we call it normalized aesthetics and non-normalized aesthetics, or this is access, providing access, and this is providing accommodation over here on this side. So we call this disability identified work. When you're leading a disability project and you are disabled, you bring your culture of disability with you. So if you're a deaf person and a signed, signed who signs, you're gonna bring your language with you. So your performance is gonna be an ASL. It's not gonna be spoken on this, sorry, on this side over here. Even though most theater is a spoken theater, unless you're doing a physical theater show, over here, it's gonna be a symbolic language. So here's Canada's disability arts domain, and these are the sort of the practices we're seeing. And here's the dividing line. Over here, we have inclusive artistic practices or inclusive theater, and those tend to be traditional forms of art. And by traditional, I don't mean traditional culturally wise, I mean traditional theater, modern Canadian drama. And we're proud of that. I love Canadian drama. I'm a theater geek to the core. And I'm really proud that David Freeman and our playwright with cerebral palsy and his show Creeps, was an integral aspect of the rise of Canadian theater in the 1970s. Like disability theater has been an integral part of the rise of Canadian drama for, this, for 50 years now. So basically you also have this practice here called arts and disability and those are for artists period. The folks who say, and that's me too, I'm a lighting designer and I'm a scenic artist by trade. When I go and paint other people's sets like Shakespeare in the Park, which I did 30 years ago, that's got nothing to do with my disability. That's me being a scenic artist. So in that case, I'm an artist who happens to have a disability and I'm engaged in art that, and I happen to have a disability. So that artwork has nothing to do with the disability. So it could be a whole bunch of artists with disabilities doing Shakespeare. That's not about disability culture. That's artists with disabilities, hooray, doing Shakespeare. So that's art and disability. But a disability identified art is about the culture of disability. So disability identified art down here is us dis stage left disabled artists working with other disabled artists to, to represent our cultural and worldviews and our models of disability. And up here, the integrated part is when we do that with our non-disabled peers. So it's an integrated cast of disabled and non-disabled artists, but the difference is it's disability led over here. We're the ones in control of the aesthetic interpretation of the show and the aesthetic realization of it. Well, on this side, it's usually our non-disabled directors. So there's a, a process of cultural interpretation that happens here. And usually if you're not familiar with the culture, I'm, I spent 40 years collaborating with First Nations in this part of the world. And I'm just confident enough now to start talking a little bit about the teachings that I've received. So it's really important, even if you, no matter how many relationships you have, I still cannot direct Indigenous theater. It's not my culture. I don't know it, but I can create safety, more safety than I could 20 years ago for Indigenous artists in collaboration with me. So that's just a distinction. And these are not binaries, it's not you do one or the other, all of us do all of them all the time because we're theater people, we work wherever we can, when we can. So I might come over here and I am an advisor to a lot of inclusive art companies. So here I'm involved in inclusive art. Sometimes I just do lighting design. So I'm just doing traditional art and so on and so forth. So that's the basic dividing line, but it's not a dividing line, it's a spectrum and we float back and forth. Okay. And here's the differences. Normalized disability theater tends to be identified with pop culture notions of disability. So we tend to minimize the disability. Yes, I'm disabled, but I'm just as capable as you. And fair enough. That's a critically important thing we have to prove to people that we are capable. But so again, to summarize impairment in normalized theater, we adapt the impairment to the art form so that we can satisfy traditional expectations of what theater is, artistic excellence. So the process is through adaptation. This becomes the, the message though becomes aligned with pop culture notions often of disability and tragedy. So a lot of disability inclusive theater is becoming educational. Look at how the disabled cope with their disabilities. That's a worrisome to us and that's why we're putting this framework out there. We want you to represent our the joys, the diversity of disability, not the tragedy of disability. 
So often this work gets curated as inclusion or empowerment or as improvement. So it's a therapy. And I'm stressing this too, because for the first 30 years of disability art, we were only ever allowed to participate in art therapy. We were not allowed to be involved in art classes because the notion was we have to be fixed. So we're really just trying to tamp that down. We don't need therapy. We just need artistic outlets. So in non-normalized disability theater, when you're disability identified, when you're identified with your culture, you affirm your disability as diversity. So look at, look at the joys of ASL. Look at us doing a whole deaf theater festival in a language that's so familiar in a culture that's so familiar to us. We're gonna let you into it and we're gonna share it with you. And that's the point of disability arts and access. The whole point of disability arts was to give all of you, the non-disabled access to us and our unique worldviews. Access has inverted that in the last 10 years, though, and it's become all about the non-disabled giving us access to your worlds. And we've had that for 50 years now. So now we're trying to say, hey, give us opportunities to show you how we live, how we do things differently. So in that case, the art form gets adapted to the disability. So we're disrupting traditional notions. So you'll see a lot of disability theater that's multidisciplinary. It's often dance theater, it's cabaret style. So it's really breaking the boundaries also because we can't get enough funding and theater's expensive. Anyway, so the process is accommodation and this is aligned with the, the cultures of deaf disability madness and disability justice. So often we will curate this as artistic innovation and transgression. And this, why I'm stressing this is this is the, this is the artistic joy of disability theater. We have the opportunity because of our unique ways of navigating the world to rehabilitate theater itself, to innovate it just by bringing the fullness of who we are onto the stage. Rather than hiding our disabilities, we're showing them to audiences and saying, look at this, look at our ways of diversity. And the goal of this is to make diversity, I mean, disability, a desirable form of diversity. Okay. And this here is the, a practice-centric framework for disability arts. And we're actually producing a disability theater symposium that's gonna talk about all of this. It's in June. And when we send the resources and archive this, we'll provide links to it. It's called Step Right Up, a practice-focused disability theater symposium. But access and everything we've been talking about in disability right now, it's all this. It's just inclusive art. But look at, sorry, look at the potential. Look at all of these ones. This is in decolonized art, in the disability arts world, when I work with indigenous artists, here's what we're doing. So the politic is about decolonizing worldviews of disability. The culture is First Nation, Métis, and Inuit, and we bring all those cultural protocols into the conversation of disability. So the worldview is not disability culture, Western models, but those collective models. The practice then becomes the aesthetics of cultural traditions and colonial transgression. So breaking the colonial rules of theater. And that's exciting. I know I've been doing theater for 40, 35 years now, and I know that a lot of our audiences are bored, and especially after COVID. They, they want new things. We have to entice them back into our theaters because now it's just so convenient to sit and watch TV after two years of COVID and being isolated. So we have to give our audiences something new. This is all the newness of disability that we're not investing in yet. So this is where DMAC and where we're trying to get everybody to move toward. Don't just be inclusive. Don't just provide access for disabled artists, provide access for all this artistic innovation. Okay, that's the last slide. Holly, anything you wanna add? No, I just wanna say that I'm grateful to be part of this presentation. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And thank you, Brad, for letting me um, expand the access spectrum a little bit beyond the norm. I'm going to close the sharing and turn it over to you. Thank you for this opportunity. On behalf of me, all a stage left in our DMAC network, we're always thrilled to be able to take our 30 years worth of national knowledge and put it out into the sector um, for consideration. We're not saying this is the one right way and you have to do it this way. We're just saying here's another perspective from more culture of some and a more diverse perspective and an entryway into access. So thank you, Brad. I'm gonna close the screen sharing. Great, thanks. Um, that was amazing. <laughs> now, it has really kind of uh, opened my mind up to, to a great deal of the possibilities. I'm thinking of um, just a, as we were kind of going through this, the accommodation um, part of it, uh, um, because I, I tend to think of, of um, totally able theater um, and presenting that to um, 
uh, a disabled audience or members of a disabled audience. And I always think uh, I can see where it's possible to do this for a particular kind of disabled audience. So if we're talking about, you know, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, for instance, I mean, you can have ASL interpretation, you could have uh, captioning across it, but we don't have the luxury of just doing, uh, of just being accommodating for one. How do you see being able to present a performance, but uh, make it accessible for um, uh, various um, uh, abilities and, um, and still be financially responsible? <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah exactly you don't you just don't so that's where that's why holly and i started with this cultural model of relationships because what we're all doing is saying oh we're going to be inclusive so we're going to put every inclusion thing uh, all of the above from all of michelle's slides out there oh but we we're going to spend all our money on this and nobody's coming because so Form relationships with your disabled constituents. Start having so host some welcoming parties. Start forming relationships with service providers. Then you'll know who's coming. Then you can because the thing, the challenging thing about access, aka accommodation, it is only individualized. So I keep saying to people like, oh, we're doing an ASL interpreted performance with all due respect. I'm like, why? How many deaf patrons do you have? I'm like, well, none. I'm like, then why are you spending with all due respect? For the interpreters, why, why are you spending all this money on interpreting when you could be paying it on fees for a deaf actor, right? So that's where the relational model. We're all thinking representation. I have to represent deaf, this oh and oh, oh and indigenous and black and uh, yeah. We're all imploding. We're tying ourselves up in knots. So that's where the relational approach to, to diversity will save your asses. Well, sorry for sorry, sorry. You the if you have to know who's coming. So you instead of just saying we're gonna do a ASL performance and hope some deaf people will show up, we're gonna go to the deaf community and say, we'd love to invite you and make the, our, our work accessible to you. Would you want to come? Hey, we could do an exclusive night for you if you want to come. Or if you if you have patrons that want to come, just tell them to let us know and we'll make sure we're captioning those evenings. So it's the only way to do access and accommodation in ways that are ethical and appropriate and not going to bankrupt us all is to do it through relationship development. Just know who your constituents are and make them welcome. Yeah. Right. I, I can, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Holly. Oh, I was just going to say, I would add to what Michelle said, um, the, the underlying principle of intentionality, right? It's not just doing things for the sake of doing it. It's not doing it to check a checkbox. Um, it's doing it with a purpose and with an impact. Well, you make me feel very guilty, actually. It's because we, um, we uh, I, I've just done a performance, um, a performance piece, a solo performance piece, and also a friend of mine also did a solo performance piece in um, rep with each other. But they had decided that yes, they you know we would do. Um, I think I did captioning. I think he did ASL interpretation. But we had no idea whether there was anybody <laughs> deaf who was coming to the show. I thought it was very very strange. So I can really see the, 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 the significance and importance of making those connections with the, with the community. And I guess um, inviting them, because if you have a run of, you know, maybe, well, whether it's four performances to 10 performances, whatever it is, you would really want to offer uh, one show with um, a, a captioning or, a, a, you know, ASL, or if you have a, a you've made connections with um, a community that, that likes those relaxed performances, you would maybe have, uh, invite them to a particular performance where they could come and do that. That makes way more sense uh, to me as far as dealing with um, uh, being open to uh, various abilities, uh, uh, very, various ability audience. So that, that's that's great. I feel much more comfortable doing that than what we did. 
I just got to um, jump in with an example for you. When I did my disability arts festival, it was an annual festival every year and it was sold out every night. Everybody was like, how? When I did the disability arts presenters never were like, we're lucky if we can get five people. It's because I'm like, well, I worked with all, I was only five nights because that's all we could afford to do because we can only get $25,000 in presenting fees. But I worked for dis five different disability service providers before then as my day jobs. So I'm like, you, you, I sold the house to this agency, Monday night's house sold to this agency. So all, so they showed up with their community and they had a big celebratory anniversary event or a volunteer appreciation event. They brought their personal, their teams with them. They brought their interpreters with them. All I had to do is create a welcoming environment. And I was able to do that because I had years of relationships with the community. And, th and that's true, like in the diversity world right now, we all know we're being included and in, in just because. <laughs> I mean, we're like, why are you doing this? So that's, that's, thank you, Brad, for reflecting on that, because that's what we want is invite us because you want us here, not just because you have to do access. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. I mean, that's just really opened my eyes to it. And, and <clears throat> to me, it really has, uh, we had a presentation um, on marketing. And really, in a way, this is marketing in, in, in itself, you know, you want to have those ambassadors, you want to have uh, those relationships with those certain communities to be able to draw them in. Uh, the one was talking about, you know, how do we get a younger audience to come to our plays because, you know, our, our theater group is, you know, appeals to older people, you know, with money. And so it's the same thing. How do you appeal to, how can you appeal to those people who have various disabilities? I, I, I found this um, very thought provoking. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thanks for that. That's that's the back feedback we hope to hear. It's not, oh, you didn't answer all my questions, but you got me thinking. So thanks for that. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there, it, there, there was so much packed into this um, presentation, right? I mean, you've just skimmed over the, the, the very tops of so many different um, uh, concepts and ideas that, uh, yeah, it's, it's now time to go and check out some of those resources you're going to send us. <laughs> yeah, and there, there are a lot of them. So just give me a bit of time, Brad, to get them all organized and collated for you. But yes, you expect a big dump of information because we want we want to we want access to be easy for people and we want people to be doing it, like Holly said, intentionally. So mm -hmm. the more resources we can provide and you don't nobody you don't need to apply for a grant and create your own access resources. They're there. There's thousands of them available. And so we will try to consolidate them and make them available in Saskatchewan through your archive site for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yay, look at us go. Thank, and yeah. thanks for creating this opportunity, Brad. Like it's, a, I think um, of all the uh, presentations I've been invited to give, this is the one that aligns most with DMAX ethos. It's just providing resources, calling on the community of people who've been doing this, live this and bring those resources forward. Cause we're seeing a lot of people trying to solve the access problem. And so we're getting all these non-disabled artists going in a room together and looking at all the laws and I'm like, you know, we did that 80 years ago, you guys, there's more to it. There's the cultural pieces. So thank you for allowing us to get to the next level of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it'll, it'll take a lot of work and, and still more time, which is probably frustrating for, but <laughs> yeah, just a, we're getting, yeah. but we're getting there, you know, and, and the other thing is why, why we can do a practice focused disability theater symposium now is because we don't have to talk about access anymore. There are so many resources and so many non-disabled producers are genuine allies now. There are so many people who have made themselves access experts and that's a great thing. Just remember though that we also need work and we are also access <laughs> experts. So it don't, even though I've done 40 years of indigenous arts, I'm not gonna take our work away from an indigenous artist in that regard. So I'm not gonna go in a room and write an indigenous arts manual but i am you know we have produced resources and they're available to you but what we forget to do is think that only oh, the disability community could educate us and so that's that's thank you for inverting that formula in the arts sector brad it's an absolute gift well it, it's also interesting to me uh to think of access and accommodation uh, because i <clears throat> i was really just kind of focused on what's the access not a, uh, not what is the accommodation that, that needs to take place. And um, I, I mean, I guess I was thinking of them as, as one unit, not as two, two different things that, that need to be um, uh, uh, thought about. Yeah, we say access is the goal and accommodation is the way you meet it. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, awesome. Uh, yeah, no, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I want to thank both uh, Michelle and Holly for uh, for their input into um, uh, this presentation. I, I think it's fascinating. I, I, I'm always sorry that people miss these things, especially live, because that's your opportunity to to ask questions and to get clarification on on, on certain things. Um, but but that one's on me, Brad, because you had we you had to schedule before, and I had to reschedule it. So my apologies, but thank you for your flexibility. Uh, not at all. It was, it was it was our pleasure. So I just want to thank our interpreters, Rachel and Sue. Thank you so much for being with us uh, over and over again over over the time we we've spent together. And Holly and Michelle, thank you so much for uh, for bringing this presentation to On Cue Regina. And. Who knows? Maybe we'll see you at the symposium. <laughs> Got to work on That's that great. ground. <laughs> Wait, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's only we have virtual access available to people, and we'll also be archiving it uh, every session and, and making it like you're doing, making it available to people. So, and we'll, uh, right. people who can attend live will provide a after like a paywall fee that'll be more affordable for people who don't want to come to the symposium. Right on. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks so much and have a have a great afternoon for everybody. Get out and enjoy some of the sunshine. Yeah, I live in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, so I'm off to do a mountain hike. <laughs> Good. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank great. you. Thanks so much, Brad. I'll follow up with all those resources next week. Beautiful. Love it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, interpreting team.